scripture that is going to resound through this series. This is what Christ gave his disciples on the way for his ascension into heaven. This was his last words to them. Let's read it together in the NIV is up here or out of your Bible. Let's read it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Then Jesus came to them and said, has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thank you. Is Jesus being understood here? Do you need me to explain this to you, what it means in the Greek? Do you need me to help you understand its cultural relevance to the Greco-Roman people? Do you need to know how this uh, was experienced by the rabbi of that time? Or do you think you can get that pretty simply right there? Jesus said, I got all the authority. So who's got all the authority? Jesus. He said, go, okay? He didn't say stay. That's why if you stay on these pews, you begin to stink, and they call it a pew, okay? He said, go, G-O, go. What don't you understand about it? Amen? He didn't say, go get your nails done. He didn't say, go buy yourself a cup of coffee at Starbucks. He said, go and make disciples. You're not going to be hanging around the discipleship tree, and all of a sudden, oh, what is that? Oh, that's a disciple. I think I'll take. No, disciples aren't just, you know, coming up out the ground. They're made. You make a disciple. Amen? And you've got to be made a disciple to make a disciple because who is he talking to? He's talking to disciples to go and make disciples. What's a disciple? Just a follower of Christ. Matthias in the Greek, a committed follower of Christ. He said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's your triune God right there. He is one God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Baptizing them in water is the sign that you're going to be that disciple. You're going to be a follower of Christ. And he said, teach them to obey just some of the easy things I've commanded you. Is that what he said? Just teach them to obey the things that won't offend anybody. (laughs) Come on. He said, teach them to obey Everything I've commanded you. Jesus did not make suggestions. Prayer is not a suggestion. It's a command. You following this to make disciples is not a suggestion. Well, I just don't know if I'm going to do that. I'm not called to do that. Well, what are you called to do? Be backslidden and go to hell with the devil? Are you, you better pick up the phone to somebody. You are either picking up the phone to Jesus saying, I'm called, you called me, I will listen. Or you're picking up the devil's line and letting them just tickle your little ears. You don't need to be a disciple. Well, thank you, devil, for telling me that because I didn't feel like being one. You don't need to command anybody anything. That's just judging people. Don't you judge them. They won't judge you. Thank you, devil, because I didn't want to be judged either. And you know what? Don't you worry about going to hell because I'm going to meet you there with all your friends and family. See, he doesn't tell you that, does he? But the devil is a very vicious attacking lion. He's not called a puppy. He doesn't say the little puppy, the devil, is just running around the world just to find somebody to just lick their little hands. The Bible says the devil, like a roaring lion, is seeking someone to devour. Resist him and he will flee. And then here's this promise to disciples. It's not promises to wannabes. It's not promises to people who are priesters coming to church on Christmas and Easter. It is a promise to his disciple. And surely I am with you always. Are you with me, God, when I lose my job? Yes, you are with me. Are you with me, God, when all hell breaks loose? Yes, I am with you always. Till when? Till the end of the age. Till the end of the age he is with his church today. You might say, what's he doing with those other folks? Read Revelation 3.16. He's puking them out, the Bible says. He says, the lukewarm he will spit out of his mouth. I don't know what you were expecting today when you came to church, but I came to preach. Is anybody here to hear a message? And God gives us grace to do this. He loves us. This is love. When I tell my daughter, you're going to grow up and be somebody great, you're going to get an education, that's because I love her. To not love her would be to say, go play in the street, drink what you want out the toilet, do whatever you want, eat what you want. We'll have ice cream three times a day. To let them run rampant is not love. 
For a pastor to tell you, do what you want, it's okay, God loves you. That's not, that's not true love. True love is to say God expects you to do something. God expects you to be this. God wants you to be this. And let me just help you out if you're finding out this Christian walk to be a little tough. Christianity is not tough. Christianity is impossible. Okay, every other religion gives you a set of works you can do to feel good about yourself. Islam, pray five times a day towards Mecca, fast during Ramadan, and don't eat pork. You'll feel pretty good about yourself. Give alms to the poor. You know, the Buddhists, the Hindus meditate a little bit. You know, be a vegetarian, and you're going to be okay. Christianity says, come and die. All your good works, your righteousness, the Bible says in Isaiah, is as filthy rags. No one in this place saves themselves. So here's the good news in the midst of the bad news. Jesus Christ didn't come to make good a bad people good. He came to make bad people good in Him. He came to make dead people live. Amen. I got it mixed up in my mind. He didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. So the good news is I'm dead in my own sins, but I'm alive in Christ. So anybody who comes to this, this passage of being a disciple, the nine mountains of influence, and you say, this is a mountain that I can't influence, you need to hear what the Bible says. The Bible says, through, all, through Christ you can do all things. That greater is He that's in you than He that is in the world. And it is this that Christ has His heart on. Before we move on, I want you to hear me today very loud and clear. God does not give a flip and a rip about your business, your life, your family, any of those things if it comes before His kingdom. I want you to understand this Dito Jesus is not here to give you the American dream with a white picket fence and just tap you on the hiney and say, I knew you could do it. He is not here to be involved in your American dream. He has set his heart on one thing and one thing only. That is the salvation of the lost. He says he leaves the 99 to find the lost. That is what Jesus is on right now. And what did he say to you? This is what he told us because I don't want to be naked and without things. He said this to us, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So those of you who may be thinking, well, I'm not into that discipleship thing. Well, this is not something that I care about. But then you want to ask God to bless you. That's like a thief coming into your house asking you for a favor after you caught him. Would you give a favor to a thief after he was in your house stealing from you? If you're stealing God's time, God's resources, God's breath that he's given you to waste it on this world, what he calls a vapor and a flower of the field, and then you're just saying, God, bless me, bless me, bless me, but I don't want to do anything for your kingdom. You're a thief and a robber in God's mind. It's not your life. The Bible says you belong to him. You've been bought with a price. I love what John MacArthur just wrote a book in big black uh, cover with white letters. You know what his cover says? Slave. Doulos in the Greek. When Paul said, I'm a doulos of Christ, it, we say the word servant, but it's not technically a servant in the sense where you can come and go as you want. The word doulos in the Greek means slave. We have become bond slaves of Christ. We belong to him. God, you want me to change a job, change a location, change my schedule? Yes, Lord. The word Lord, kurios in the Greek, means master, boss. You're in charge, I'm not. Discipleship of the nations is what Jesus is on right now. And when people begin to find their purpose in each one of these mountains, you can see the difference you can make. How many have ever heard of t Bowen? Anybody know what t Bowen is? A few of the sports fans in here. Tim Tebow, pastor's son doing great for the Denver Broncos as a quarterback. Whenever he does something great, he goes down on his knee and he gives God thanks. And now it's called Tebow and people walking around in their high schools, these young people being influenced, doing what they call Tebowing. You see, God is using him as a football player to make an influence on people's lives. What did that Chicago Bear do just a few months ago? Got arrested for selling drugs. Does anybody hear about that? Anybody hear about that? Come on. You see, you're going to use your influence for good or for evil. God is saying, use it for me and I'll bless you. I love looking at my dad as an example when he was a businessman. He's now retired and my dad in our hometown would rent out the box seats for the, the minor league football team that we would have there, the arena football. And he would have the best seat in the place and 100 people or so could fit into this box seat. And he brought me there one time and he said, these are all my top clients and I just want to thank them for being with me this year and making me number one. My dad was number one in a few of his uh, places of business and what he did. He was a financial 
financial planner, stockbroker, and he had number one uh, positions. And he said, I want to thank them for making me number one with their, their trust in me. And so when we were up there, my dad said, let me get everybody's attention. You know me as a businessman. You know me for taking care of your wealth and your finances. But I want to tell you, I trust my life to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has made the difference in my life. And I remember sitting back there watching my dad saying, these are the greatest words I've ever heard any preacher say. Here's a businessman in front of his client saying, I'm not ashamed. It's Jesus Christ that made me successful. And then he said, here's my son. He's a pastor. He's going to pray for us. And if you don't know the Lord, doesn't matter what you have in life, you're not going to be blessed when you die. You need Jesus. Come see him up after the, the game starts, and he'll talk to you about Christ. It was the most honored I've ever felt being with my dad, watching him use his mountain of influence, not to be wealthy, to act like he's better than everyone, but to humble himself and say, I owe it to God. David Montez is out right now with his business. He said a $3 million broker a year stood up in the company in front of everybody and said, and finally, but not last, but not least, last but not least, Jesus Christ is my confident in business. I give all the glory to him. You see, wherever we are in life, if we give God the glory, we can influence people. You say, Pastor, I don't have a million dollars. I don't have a lot of people around me. What you're going to learn today is you have a family around you. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. You start with the family. And I will dare to say, and I believe I can back it up biblically, that the family is the greatest mountain of influence you'll ever have in life. The people around you. In your family. Now at this moment, some might be thinking of a family that wasn't so perfect, that wasn't so great, that's something that brought you pain. And I want to share with you a story about my family as well. My mother is Italian, and her name is Bodrero. My dad's last name is Vorostic. And the English pronunciation for all you Americans here, it's Wyrostic. But if you have a Polish little blood in you, you can say Vorostic. So everybody say Vorostic. Amen. Now let me tell you a story here in the story about being Polish, okay? Now, I, went, I grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where there was nobody Polish, and I was the Polak. And I got all the Polak jokes, okay? I didn't know anybody Polish. I didn't know anything other than my dad being Polish. And I got made fun of for being Polish. So after Bible college in New Orleans, I came here to Chicago seven years ago. And I said, now I'm with my people. I am with my gente. Dobrze, jak szmash. And guess what? They made fun of me. They say, oh, you're not Polish. You haven't come from Poland. So I got made fun of for being Polish. And then I got made fun of by the Polish people. Sometimes I wish my name was Bedrero, the Italian side. Because I think I fit in with the Italians. But my mother's maiden name, Bedrero, was special to me. And I said to her, you know, because we've had two girls, Mom, when we have our first boy, and now Nancy has one in the oven, we've already named him Lucas. Greek is for Luke, Lucas. And, and I said, when we have our first boy, I want their middle name, his middle name to be Bedrero, to honor your family. Because my mother didn't have any male siblings. She was an only child. And, uh, you know, only child that survived. And I'll tell you that story in a moment. But she said, no. She said, Joe, I don't want you to have that name for your child. She said, I don't ever want to hear that name again. She said, now that my mom and dad have died, I want that name to be buried. And, I, and this was just a few, few uh, maybe a year ago, maybe two years at the most. And I said, Mom, why? Why don't you want us to name our child Bedrail? And she said, well, my father was a very mean, bitter man even to the bitter end. She said, when he had, they had me, they had a little boy. And we were riding one day in the car, and he opened up the door while they were driving, and the boy fell out, and the car behind them ran over the boy. She said, my father, your grandfather, was never the same since then. Not that he was physically abusive, but verbally abusive. I said, what about grandma? What about grandma? She said, grandma would just cower down, not stand up to him. And so for her whole life, she grew up with a verbally abusive dad that never told her he loved her. And when I said to my mom, I want to give the name Bedrero to our son, she said, I don't want that name. I don't want to remember it. It comes with so much pain. And I want you to think about this. If you're here today, when I talk about family, if that's the first gut feeling you get is my family wasn't the greatest family. I was neglected. I was abused. You'd be surprised how many times up here at these altars people confess physical, uh, you know, uh, mental abuse out of their family. But I want to give you hope today. 
that Jesus Christ can use you to heal a broken family. Because what my grandfather wasn't, my mother was. My grandfather was bitter and a stingy man to the very end. But my mother was a giver and a lover. She met Jesus before she had me. And then I grew up in a Christian home. And I never would have known that that's where my mother had come from. And my grandfather died close to being a millionaire with all of these things. So stingy. Never took my mother even out to eat. But guess what? When he passed away, my mother started giving away all of his things. The car that I drive is Grandpa's car. Thank you, Grandpa, if you made it to heaven thank you if not i'm glad i have it you know listen to me she started to give his his money away to church did more than tithe gave generous offerings and said we're just going to take to many to heaven as we can help the poor and the hurting so everything everything that my grandfather wasn't my mother was and if you're here today and you're saying i need to be that you can be or if you came from a great family you can carry on the lineage amen Let's go to Ephesians 3.14. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family on earth uh, and heaven on earth derives its name. You see, my last name is Wyrostic. Wyrostic, what is your last name? You know where it came from in a family tree, but guess what God says here? We all bear his name. In the, in the time of the Bible, they would say Simon Bar-Jonah. You've heard that, right? Simon Bar-Jonah. The word Bar just simply means son. Simon, the son of Jonah. Guess what? I might have been born the son of Jim Wyrostic and bore that name, but I was born again, Joe, the son of God. Come on, somebody. Is there anybody here that now bears the name of the Father? You are a child of God. Ishmael, a child of God. Lauren, a daughter of a king come on somebody and even those who are not born again still bear his name because if it wouldn't have been for his act of creation ex nihilo creating the world out of nothing making it something i believe in a big bang god spoke it bang it happened baby like that come on he created all that we know here today so whether we have a good family jacked up family or a blessed family it all comes back down to god that's what he's saying you keep going verse 16 i pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. God wants Christ to dwell in your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's keep going. And I pray that you be rooted and established in love. Can somebody say love? Thank you may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide. Everybody go like this, wide. Come on, put out your belly. Wow. <laughs> Amen. Now, how long? Stretch out like how long? And how high and how deep is the love of Christ to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Where do I believe? The width, the length, the height, and the depth of love comes from the most Family. Think about it. Family. Your mother taking care of you was the first and greatest, deepest place on this earth you've ever experienced love. Your father growing up in a family. You see, God gave the family as the first act of creation to human beings. After he created their home, the Garden of Eden, he created Adam. And he said, Adam, here's the animals. Have fun. Now, you know some guys, they like pet snakes, little tarantula, little pet dog. But this guy got bored with animals. How many know guys, animals are cool, but they get a little boring after a while? So he looked at Adam and he said, okay, Adam's tired of playing with the bear, the lion, the leopard. He put him to sleep, took out a rib, and out of the dust of the earth formed a, a beautiful creature. When Adam woke up and opened his eyes and saw her, he said, whoa, man, whoa. Oh, man, that's where a woman got her name from. He said, whoa, man. And, and he looked at Eve, and, and then God said, yes, I know what you want to do. And I bless it. Be fruitful and multiply. So he said, here is the greatest treasure on earth. It wasn't to build big buildings. It wasn't the mountain of art. It wasn't the mountain of politics, of business. The very first place he gave us was a place of influence. The greatest place he wanted us to see his love was in the family. 
And is it any coincidence that when the devil attacks, that all of his arrows, that his biggest cannons, the strongest demons come against the family? You know why? Because the devil knows if I can destroy the family, I can destroy the image of God on this earth. The Bible says he made them male and female in his image. The male and female together being one, complement each other, make the complete nature of God and his emotion and character. When you look at the Old Testament, you see references to a mother, how he loves us in Jeremiah, wants to gather us in his wings in Matthew, how he broods over us as a mother fe- a mother hen with her feather, Psalms 91, and then all of the masculinity of the God of war and, and the God of judgment and of power authority and the Abba Father that he is in the Bible. Male and female complete his image. And then the offspring represent the the creation, which we call procreation, that God made us in his image to procreate. He creates, we procreate. That means he gives us the materials, the DNA, and we procreate from his creation. They ask me what will happen if we can clone children and all of this. We're going to get them saved and go to heaven. Amen? Because all they're doing is playing with the Lincoln Logs of DNA that God already created. Here's a bigger trick. Start with nothing and now create something. Can you do that, Mr. Scientist? Okay, if you can't do that, sit down with Bubba and start worshiping Jesus. Amen? I don't care how smart you think you are. Take, take nothing and then create something until you can't worship the God that can. The Bible says that there is a love that comes in our heart when we're rooted and grounded in Christ. And he makes the reference of family here. And I believe looking at Genesis and looking at this scripture, I believe we see that family is the greatest place to see love. And as well as hurt, but I believe we can turn it for God's good. Here's five types of families. You've seen this before. If you remember, uh, maybe six months ago, we did a series on the call to a godly family. But you're going to learn a different aspect as we look at influence today. Here's five types of places where we would call the family. Single without children. So you're by yourself or you're in a roommate situation. You don't have any children. Number two, you're single with children. Single mom, single father, and you have children. Number three, you're married without children. And so you're just having a lot of recreational fun right now. You're enjoying life. Amen. And all the single people don't you hate, just celebrate. Amen. You're going to get married one day too. Okay, and all sex and love and all that is only blessed in marriage. Amen. Amen. Outside of marriage, it will damn your soul. It's not worth it. The Bible even says to lust after another uh, that you're not married to is the same as adultery. Then we got married with children, not the TV show, but what God calls a blessed life. Married with children. And then you have married to an unbelieving spouse. And I'm going to talk about why that is so important in just a moment. But let's start with the first kind of family, single without children. You have an influence factor in your life as a disciple that you can do if you're single and you don't have any children. And that influence factor that you have to give is time. Somebody say time. Now, I want to look at our youth here. I'm going to look at our young adults, and I know you're just so busy. You're so busy going to school, spending your parents' allowance, okay, all those hard things that you do. But I want you to listen to me right now. You've got life good. And the best thing you have as a disciple to give back to the family is your time. So teenagers, when the room is dirty and mom is busy, guess what you should say? I'll clean it. I've got plenty of time. All you guys right back here, you know, when your mom is saying, hey, clean up your room, she needs to come in and see a room already clean and say, hey, can I now do the dishes? I just got so much time. And let me just tell young people right now, if you don't have free time, it's because you're wasting your time. And the enemy of free time is not church time. It's not education time, work time, family time. The enemy of your free time is wasted time. So don't tell me, well, I'm too busy to spend time with my family. I'm too busy to go to church. I'm too busy. Shame on you. You're not too busy to play TV, watch movies and sports and get all wacky on Facebook. You're just wasting your time. I'll preach to myself. Amen. Some parents say, amen, help me out here. And if you don't live at home and you're like a bachelor to the rapture and your your apartment smells like a gym locker or something, you know, just live with what you have there and take the time and give it to church. Be a part of the youth group. Be a part of the evangelism team. 
I'm so tired of this ninny, ninny poo poo spirit of these young adults. Oh, I'm just, it's just so hard being a young adult with my phone and with my car and with my school being paid for by loans. It's just so hard. It's just, let me tell you what hard is. Let me tell you, raising children is hard. Being married is hard, but it's worth it. Where's Nancy? It's just hard. It's just, let me tell you the truth. No. Singles, if you don't think, singles, if you don't think, if you don't think that you have a lot of free time, then just babysit my kids for a couple of days, okay? And then you'll realize how much time you really have. You're just wasting it. Use it for God. Come early. Stay late. Find a church to be a part of. Join something that builds your character. It's okay to work out, stay in shape. How many know when you were single, you were in the best shape of your life? Amen. I gained 50 pounds being married with children. It is like it is like my way of like you know exposing you know pushing out any type of affair. I have just like uglified myself, you know. But that's okay. I'm going to lose it this year. Okay. I'm going to lose it this year. That's my goal. Praise God. At least I got my hair, though. At least I got my hair. If if you're losing your hair, I'll pray for you. Amen. (laughs) The second one here is single with children. Now, these are the ones we feel the most compassion for because they've got to do the work of a mom and a dad. And let me encourage you today, if you're in this situation, the Bible says God cares about you a lot. You read the book of Proverbs and Psalms. The Bible says God personally is a father to the fatherless. God will be with you, strengthen you, encourage you. And here is the factor, the influence factor that you have, faithfulness. Because if you give up, where are they going to be? But when you stick it out as a single mom and you use the church to help you, I mean, if you just met here at every time we had a service, we're at least taking 25 hours of of babysitting church, you know, children watching time for you, you know. I mean, that's quite a bit of time right there. You can go out and just enjoy yourself. Come, you know, say, no, you're staying for the second service. You're staying right here. Mom and dad are going to go out and do something for a couple hours. Take advantage of it. They're nine years old. Bring them to the youth group. No, I'm just kidding. We can't take them that young. But, you know, do something. Bring them on Wednesdays. We'll help you. But the most important thing, single moms, is your, your, your faithfulness. Because when you stick it out through those hard times, God is going to bless you. And single fathers, God is dependent upon you. Now, I used to work in the inner city of New Orleans in nine different housing projects, Calio projects, Iberville projects. And I saw a lot of deadbeat fathers out there. Now, of course, they're everywhere. But a lot of times we wonder, why did our inner cities get to be where they were? Well, what happens is the devil attacks the home and he takes the men outside of the home. And these men will spend money on different things, but not on their children. If you're here today, I don't care where you're from. The Bible says you're worse than an unbeliever. You're an infidel. You will split hell wide open because the kingdom of God belongs to children. And if you cause a children to stumble or fall, the Bible says to you, sir, it would be better for you to take a millstone, hang it around your neck, and drown yourself in the sea. In our language, it would be better for you to blow your head off with a shotgun than to not take care of your children. The influence of Christ in your life will help you. Maybe you're struggling in this economy. And I know that men have even dealt with suicide. I heard of one man, he committed suicide because things were so bad in his life. He couldn't take care of his children. Well, let me tell you, the answer is don't kill yourself. The answer is keep working, keep trying, get up again, fight again. There's hope out there for you. You dying and killing yourself probably damns you to hell for eternity. And then it destroys the little you were doing in your family. So fathers, stick with it. Mothers, stick with it. There is a mountain that you are standing on, and it's a mountain of faithfulness. I look up to it. I do. When I see single mothers living for God, I look up to it. John Wesley grew up in a family with about ten children. His dad was always away off at, at work doing different things. Susanna was the mother, and she would be in charge raising these children. She would get so frustrated, so so busy at times. She would say to the children, whenever you see mom pull up the apron, I'm praying, asking God for help. Just leave me alone. And you know, John Wesley said that my mom would come outside of that apron glowing like an angel. God would meet her there. I don't care if you've got to put your children all in one room and say mama's got to pray find strength in Jesus Christ you're not alone he'll do it for you amen 
And the Bible also promises, if it is your heart's desire, that he takes the lonely and he puts them in houses of blessing. And it specifically speaks about in the Old Testament times, these women would die and become, uh, the husbands would die and the women would be widows and how much harder it was for them back then. And God said, I look after those widows. I'm a father to the fatherless and a helper to the oppressed and the widow. I will take the lonely and put them in places of blessing. There's a promise for you to remarry, to start life again. Now there's married without children. And these are the ones I think all the married people we sometimes envy. You know, because they have the influence factor of resources. And that's exactly how they look. They just always have a cheesy smile. Hey man, we're, we're going on a vacation. Where are you going? Are you doing Lake Geneva? Lake Geneva? No, no. We're going to Puerto Vallarta. I thought you just went to Hawaii six months ago. Oh yeah, I take five vacations a year. I have two cars. I have five TVs. You know why? Because you're married without kids. You have all the resources in the world. You're on a mountain of influence. Why don't you share them? Why don't you start to give a little extra to the church or find a person in the youth group and supply their need or pick up people with that big SUV or nice car that you're driving or begin to, instead of taking five vacations, come with us to India. Instead of going to Puerto Vallarta, come to Vijayawada, India in June and help feed the orphans and the widows with us out there. You have a, you have a busy life being married and working. We understand that. But you still have a little bit more time as a resource as well. And once again, married couples without children, if you don't think you have that much free time, just come babysit my kids for a while, and then you'll realize the amount of time you have because children take a lot of time. Now I'm happy to have children. I don't want you to get me wrong, but being single, uh, excuse me, not bearing children for a season is good if you can use it for God. You can give more time to your job. You can invest into the things of the future to save, and you can invest into the church because when the children come, that free time just goes right out the window. Can somebody say amen? Now, i got a great story here for you. Samuel uh, records a story about his mother, Hannah. And Hannah uh, was married to her husband, and she couldn't have any children. And she would get double the gifts of those that could have children. And so that's what we look at, is those that don't have it to spend it on the children can get double. And so God blesses you, but use it for his kingdom. Amen? Now, the next one here, I want to, and I hope that I've done justice up until this point, so now you'll hear my heart right. When we talk about married with children, the influence factor is stability. I want you to understand this. This is the building block of civilization. That is not an understatement. I'm going to say it again. One man, one wife, children, God-fearing is the building block of civilization. It is the building block that God built the greatest nation of the Mesopotamian culture, the Israelites, It is the best building block that built Western civilization and made America what it is today. Not to step into politics, but that's why we say not two men, not two women, not one man, many women, one man, one woman, that's marriage. Give it to me to vote a hundred times. I'm going to keep voting that. Amen? Amen. Because we have tracked it through societies. We see it biblically. Any way you want to look at it, sociologically, anthropology, the study of man, everywhere we look, this is the building block of society. Now, hopefully I've done justice to these other ones so you don't feel bad if you're in a situation that is not this, but this needs to be our model. This is the model that we all need to have. Now, if you have lost family members, there, that is out of your control. If, if you have come from a family that was broken, that is out of your control. If you're single uh, because of bad decisions in the past or because of bad decisions people have made, that is out of your control. But what we all should agree on is this is the goal. The goal is until death do we part, not divorcing, staying together, married, and raising our children together. This, to me, is the greatest mountain in the entire planet. This mountain of influence, I believe, is what changes nations. When the father is, as God calls him to be, a provider for his family, a lover and a a nourisher of his wife, when the wife is who she is supposed to be, a submissive woman unto her husband, serving and caring for the children, when the children are submitting unto their parents and the parents are teaching their children and the fear and admonition of God, this is heaven on earth. 
This is heaven on earth. Now I know speaking to the 21st century where Oprah Winfrey was somehow giving marriage counseling with her living in adultery to Stedman with homosexuals on the panel. When this has become where we get our advice from, it's gotten pretty messed up in here. That's why we need to turn the world upside down or rather right side up again. I'm not ashamed to teach men to be a men. Women, if you want to work, that's wonderful, but it should be an option, not a must. The man should not marry you or start having a marital relations with you unless he can provide for you and the children. I still believe that. In children, I still believe in the death penalty of the Old Testament for rebellious children. We'll take you out and stone you and make another just like you. So fear God and fear your parents. I'll tell you what, the reason why these young people don't fear the law is because they don't fear their parents. Many of us were brought up in homes where we feared our parents more than we feared the law. It was like, Judge, you gave me an e-. I remember with my dad, I got 40 hours of community service in fifth grade for breaking into my first house at, at fifth grade. And I remember saying to myself, you just let me off easy because when I get home, it is not going to be like that. And the Bible says that you spare the rod and not the child. That means you will break a rod over your boy's butt, over your child, before you will not let their butt get busted. Now, we've seen this go to an extreme where they leave marks, they become abusive. Shame on you. You should know the difference, parents. Amen. It doesn't give you the right to beat them and hurt them, but you need to discipline your children. Now, take that model, husband, wife, children, the things of God. What better way to build a culture and a church, society, a nation, Than upon that. And so today my prayer is that we will all aim for this. And there are people, by the way, the Bible does say that will stay single the rest of their life. I had a beautiful professor in Bible college. Her name was Professor Joanne Miller. Hopefully she'll come and speak to us now. She's uh, getting into her 70s. And she uh, was from Guyana, South America. One of the most anointed women of God I've ever met in my life. Planted churches. Done so many wonderful things. But God told her to do that. And so unless God tells you to be single... Aim your heart at a family. Amen? And then for those who may say, you know what, we cannot have children, I would say adopt and look into foster care. Not only is it for those who can't afford, I mean, excuse me, that can't uh, 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 have children naturally, it's actually a command of the Bible. The Bible says this in the book of James, true and undefiled religion is to take care of orphans and widows. All of us should not be asking the Lord, uh, should I adopt? We should all be asking the Lord, how do I adopt? Do I adopt by supporting foster care in other homes and orphanages? Do I adopt by taking them in temporarily? We should not be asking, should I adopt? We all should be asking how we can adopt. And I know there's many families in here because we're a young church that are already saying, Pastor, God has laid it on our heart to do these things. And you will see that as an influence in this church. You will see us doing that for this community. And lastly, but not least, those that are married to an unbeliever, the Bible says they are in a particular situation. Now, this could have happened by them uh, trying to missionary date. You said, hey, I'm a Christian. They're not a Christian, and I'm going to try to win them to the Lord by my love. And how has that worked out for you? They're still as lost as a goose in a hailstorm. They don't know the Lord from the man on the moon, and now you're in trouble because they don't want you to go to church. They want you to stay at home. Or you were someone that was married, and then in marriage, one of you got saved, and now the other one is lagging behind. I want you to take comfort in your influence factor, because you have a great one, and it is prayer. The Bible actually even promises you here in 1 Corinthians 7 that you can see the lost husband or wife saved. It's a promise. Lord, I believe that my husband will serve you. Pray that. You say, Pastor, when should I stop praying that? When he gets saved. You pray until, push, pray until something happens. Pray until he or she meets us up at these altars and accepts Christ. That's a promise, not mine, from the Bible. And also in the book of Acts, he said to the jailer, not only you will be saved, but you and your household will be saved. I want to ask you to stand on that mountain of influence And pray and say, God, I'm holding on to you until you answer me with the salvation of my spouse. Here they are all together. If you're single without children, give your time to change the world. If you're single with children, use faithfulness in that family to make a difference. If you're married without children, share those resources that you have. The Bible says, freely you've received, now freely give. 
If you're married with children, ask God to make you stable because we know those of us who are married with children, there is a lot of pressure on us at all times to provide, to be the husband, to have the right way of treating our wives and to raise our children. There's so much pressure on that family and every arrow is pointed at that every sitcom makes the dad look like a boob it makes him look like a nincompoop every every magazine thing is sell, selling the woman a body image not of a mother but of a prostitute all the world is attacking this institute but we need to pray for stability in our families that we stay strong amen uh, number five married to an unbeliever your greatest influence factor is to pray one day that spouse will look up to you. And let me just say this because I know mostly in our church we see the women praying for their husbands. Don't be afraid to still submit, to serve in all ways that you can. Show him, like the Bible says, by your deeds of humility that you're not trying to wear the pants in the family. And as he tries to come to church, don't make him feel intimidated that you know more because men don't want to feel like that in the presence of their wife. You know, when he comes to church, let him feel like he's gladiator and he just won the greatest battle. Come on, kids, let's give it up for Dad. He came to church. He read his Bible. He knows so much. He is the man of the family. And I don't care if he can only pray a two-sentence prayer God bless the food. Have him pray. Because as that begins to work into the family, he'll begin to see he can be in the man that he's been called to be. Amen. Amen. Would you stand up to your feet? Can we bless the Lord today for families? Amen. Come on, somebody. I believe God for families today. Ben, would you come in closing today? I can't express to you how important I feel this is. At the beginning of a new year, that we would use our families for what God called them to be, places of love and places of teaching and discipleship. The first man that I ever saw pray wasn't the pastor. It was my father. The first woman that ever taught me something about Jesus and Noah's Ark wasn't the Sunday school teacher. It was my mom. The first outreach to do something good for the community wasn't from the youth pastor. The first person I saw do it was my parents. The first life group that I was ever a part of was me being upstairs in the bedroom with the kids and mom and dad downstairs teaching other families. The first act of charity to a, uh, um, a handicapped person that needed help consistently in life. I didn't see at a charitable organization, I saw my mom do it all the time for a dear woman named Sharon who had multiple sclerosis and a chemical imbalance. I saw her give her life to help her. The family is where God's presence is modeled. I remember the first time when I was in Bible college missing my family and crying and just being so alone. Brother Anthony, who is now the pastor of our ministry, he sits on the board. He's over us because I need somebody smarter than me to help make decisions. Amen. I never want to be the only one in charge. I thank God for authority. He humbly does it. He says, Pastor uh, Joe, I he calls me pastor. He says, Pastor Joe, I love you, and it's an honor to serve you here. You'll meet him if you haven't already. He comes and blesses us once a year. He invited us over to his house, and I was so homesick, you know. And uh, I remember sitting on the, the couch and, and, and watching the kids play, and they were so much obedient. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Uh, four boys, that's a miracle. They were, they were rambunctious, but they were obedient, you know. And then we sat at the table, and then we had a meal. And then before we got up, kids, before we get up, we're going to read a scripture. And then you're going to tell me what you think. And I'm thinking, I just arrived at the Waltons. I thought I just, whoop, just went back in time. Like, I'm at Leave it to Beaver's house now. This is like, come on, 10, 15 years ago. And I'm sitting there. And, and some of you know from SUM Justice, who is now a youth pastor, John Mark, Jordan, Josiah, would all sit around the table. Well, Dad, I... I think that that psalm means that Jesus, he loves us. Oh, man, I can, I can just remember like it was yesterday. It was like they were sitting on a mountain. And I was looking at that influence and I was saying, God, give me a family like that. Give me a family like that, Jesus. And I teased myself a lot for being single for eight years after I got saved, like a bachelor to the rapture from 18 to 28. But there was only one reason. One reason and one reason only. 
is because I wasn't going to settle for anything less than what Sister Melanie was. I wanted a wife like how Sister Melanie was a wife. And I wanted my wife to be able to homeschool our children and and to do this was for me, just for me. And I wanted to homeschool and I wanted a house that when we sat around the table, we would do devotions. I remember one time taking a young man from the inner city, Anthony, with me to do some preaching around the country. And I would say, here's Anthony, one of these young men from the Iberville. And I remember one time, he would tell his testimony, I remember one time we were at a church in Missouri and they took us home to eat and, and, and they had some homemade catfish and they prayed and they did very much the same thing. And I remember Anthony coming to me afterwards and he said, I never thought I would have a TV dinner. And I said, what are you talking about, man? It wasn't no TV dinner. It was some good southern cooking. He said, no, I'm talking about those dinners you see on TV where the family and the father and the mother and they pray. He said, I never thought I would have been a part of that. You see, we sit on mountains of influence in our families. You might have come from a broken family, but you can be a healer to that. And one last story. There was a young lady that was a part of our youth group, and she met me at an altar just like this. And Because we're going to open it up for those that have hurt from their family, you know, maybe just some deep pain. We want to pray for you today. Uh, She came to an altar like this, and she said, I'm having to go from couch to couch to couch. We said, why? She said, because my mom and dad are on drugs come to find out she still had perfect attendance at lane tech never even missed a day had perfect attendance but had to go from couch to couch to couch eventually her mom died of a drug overdose i did the funeral a year later her father died of a drug overdose had to do the funeral she stayed in college she kept going now she's happily married And she works in social services with a master's degree. She decided in her life, even though this was handed to me, I'm going to turn it for God's good. Even though grandpa, my father, he didn't love me. My mom said, I'm going to love my son and I'm going to be a giver. She said, even though my parents are on drugs, I'm going to love my husband live holy and work in social work you see we can we can choose we can't choose where we came from but we can choose where we're going Let's pray today in Jesus' name. I ask us, I ask you today, God, to make us families that are healthy and whole wherever we are today. Whether we're single, married, with children, with an unbelieving spouse, that, Lord, you use us to be an example. And you start right now. Would you pray for your family right now for the next few moments? Come on, would you pray for your family? If you're single, pray for your parents. Pray for them that God would bless them. If they don't know the Lord, pray that they would come to know Jesus. If you're a single mother, pray for your children to never skip a beat. Those statistics are against them. You're going to break those statistics. You're going to raise up mighty men and women of God. If you're married without children, ask God to bless your marriage. And ask Him to prepare you to share your resources. If you're married with children, you know you got a lot to pray about. Come on. Pray for your wife. Pray for your children. Pray that God will bless you to provide for them. And if you're with an unbelieving spouse, pray for their salvation. The new year is a time to build our families. Let's pray right now. 60 more seconds. Jesus, bless my family, God. I need you, Jesus. Make me the husband, the father that I can't be without you, God. I need your help, Jesus. Give me wisdom, God. Give me strength, oh God. Oh, Lord, let me influence my children, oh God. Oh, God, make me an example unto them, Lord. Let me not exasperate them or frustrate them. May I be an encourager. Bless Nancy, God, as she bears our even our third child. Give her strength. Oh, God, bless Bethany and Hannah. May they grow up strong. To always know and love you. To fulfill the purpose that you put on their life. Bless them with health, God. Education and a long life, Lord. Bless baby Lucas, God. My wife's womb, Lord, let her come out, let him come out healthy and whole, God. Let him live a life, God, like you, God. 
and serving the apostles, being a man of, after your heart. And we pray for others' families. Now, 60 seconds, would you pray for others' families right now? I pray for the families of this church. I pray for you today, single mothers. Oh, that you would get encouragement today. God would strengthen you, single fathers, that you would provide that would be stable, husbands pure, coming against pornography, perversion that attacks the men of this church. God, purify them in their marriages. Lord, I pray for wives, God, for humble heart submission, God, like unto the church, like the church of the promise. Give them a joy, God, to serve you, to know you, to love you, to raise their family and children. Oh, for unbelieving spouses to come to know you in this church. That this year, every unbelieving spouse would accept you, God. Every unbelieving child would come back home, Jesus, to you, Lord, would accept you in their heart. Hallelujah. Altar workers, would you come? We're going to get ready to dismiss. But I'm going to have altar workers here to pray with you. If you have a need of any kind, healing or a blessing of any kind, we'll, a need of a blessing, we'll pray for you today. But really specifically, we want to pray for those that either need encouragement or healing in their family. You can come up husband and wife or with your children or children. You can come up pray for your mom or dad. We just want to pray for you today if you need it. God, as we close out today, Lord, let the families be built upon Jesus Christ, rooted and established in love. May we know, God, the width, the length, the height, the depth of that love more than we've ever known before. May we be filled with this love that surpasses knowledge and be given into the fullness of who you are. Bless us this year. Let this be a year that our families grow in our love for you and each other. In Jesus' name, if you receive it, can you say, Amen. Amen. Can you bless the Lord today? Hallelujah.